Lord. Book of First Corinthians, chapter number 11, verses number 2, Paul writes and he says, I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I pass on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. For declares, a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Six declares, yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut all, should, should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory a woman reflects man's glory. Eleven declares, but among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman. And everything comes from God. And the people of God said, amen. some of you are like, I don't, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm saying amen to that one or not. Father, I love you so much. Thank you, God, for clarity. I'm asking for your chiefest of anointings to rest upon me, God, as I not give my opinion or minister from my traditional standpoint, but God, I just want to highlight what the word of God says to the edification of the body of Christ, and it is in Jesus' mighty name, and everybody says. Amen. So, um, interesting, my wife uh, asked her and one of her friends to help me yesterday to 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 look up just some statistics when it comes to gender inequalities. And it's pretty interesting that these, um, these thoughts uh, that they, they brought to my attention. Um, women earn 83% of what men earn, according to a Pew Research um, Center analysis of medium hourly earnings of both full-time and part-time American workers. By this math, it would take an extra 44 days of work for women to earn what men do. Although women make up nearly 51% of the U.S. population, only 25% of the Senate and 23% of the House is comprised of women. Women are 15% less likely to actually get promoted, according to recent study. Um, women only account for 11% of directors in Hollywood. Actresses earned only about 35% on the dollar compared to their male counterparts. Um, this is interesting. Rogaine costs 40% more for women than it does for men, even though the medication is exactly the same. Um, men's deodorant is cheaper than women. And finally, Viagra isn't taxed but tampons are. <laughs> wow. wow. Sister like, are you serious? <laughs> Now, now watch this. I want to highlight a couple of things that, and, and it's interesting because in society, it's still, not just in um, Eastern con countries, but even in, in the United States, the value of women is, is it's devalued. And um, sad to say, a lot of that even stems out of the church because of erroneous um, teaching and just bad scriptural, biblical interpretations of texts. And so there are a couple of things that I want to highlight in, in the scripture today. Ephesians 5.22, the Bible declares, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands, um, as do to the Lord. 23 says, for the husband is, somebody shout the head. Now, now watch this. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. So unashamedly, um, headship is leadership, and this is what God has done. Um, God has set the husband as the, the leader of the home. That's God's order. But in the church, we've actually perverted this concept and we've transposed what God has done in the home to reflect every facet of society. God says that the husband is the leader in the home. He didn't say that he had to be the leader in the church. He had to be the leader in government. He, did, he had to be the leader in, in, in business or society. No, the church, we tried to transpose that because if we accept that, that, that there's only male leadership in any industry, in any society, then there are a lot of scriptures we need to rip out of our Bible right now. 
because Deborah, she was a leader over Israel. She was a prophetess and she was a judge. Anna was a prophetess. Um, Janiah, she was a female apostle. There's a female deacon in the scripture and the apostle Paul, when he gives accommodations to one of the churches, he highlights a, a pastoral couple and he names the woman first. In naming her first, that probably means that she's the senior leader of the church, even above her husband. So if we just say that, yeah, 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 not only is he the leader in the home, but he should be the leader in society, that's not what the Bible says. The scripture teaches that the husband leads the home, but women have the right to lead in society. Now, now watch this. Headship is leadership. And let's talk about, first of all, what leadership is not. Uh, leadership is not male domination, dictatorship, abuse. Neither is it control. Neither is it. Woman, you better do what I say up in her. You finna get whooped. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, I've, never, I've never hit my wife. I've never hit my wife. I've never abused my wife. But I did just look at her crazy one time. And when I looked at her crazy, she was sitting down, and she got up, and she said, oh, it's like that now, huh? <laughs> so we nipped all that in the bud right then and there. She ain't got a crazy look since. Leadership is not male domination, dictatorship, abuse of control, and we're talking about leadership in the home, but leadership, somebody shout leadership. This is what, uh, fellas, let me hear you say, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Said that boy, yeah. yeah. Ah. Leadership in the home, it looks like this. And first of all, it looks like you modeling. Don't do what I say, but how about doing what I do? It's about modeling. Number two, leadership is about peacemaking. You should be the first one to make peace in the house. So that means you should be the first one to either apologize or forgive. Leadership is about vision casting. You want your wife to follow you, but bro, where you going? <laughs> Ultimately, leadership is about responsibility. Yes, it is. So, so this is what happened a couple of days ago. Um, I had to apologize to uh, one of the members in the church because I asked them to do something. And after asking them to do something, I did it myself. <laughs> and I know that's wrong because as a leader, when you appoint somebody or you ask someone to do that, you back up and you give them the leader and the creativity to carry it out. But I apologized to them because what I did was wrong, and I knew it was wrong, and I explained to them. I said, listen, um, when I thought about it, I, my hands need to stay on it because this is, this, this is critical. You know, there are some things in life you can, fail to, you can afford to fail forward in. Well, this wasn't one of them things. <laughs> and if it fails, they're not looking at you, they're looking at me. So, brothers, if your marriage failed, God said, I ain't looking at the sister. I'm saying, Adam, where art I ain't looking at your kids. You can point the finger at the kids. You can point the fingers at your wife. But if the marriage fails, I'm coming to you first. Can somebody say amen to that? So, so watch this. Watch this. The Bible declares, the Bible declares, wives, submit yourselves not to a man, not to a man, but submit yourself to what, y'all? Your own husband. So, so I've been hearing this particular scripture literally all my life. All my life, every time Reb got up to preach, he'd go to uh, uh, Ephesians 5, 22. But to my surprise, they never go to 21 where it says submit to one another. I'm like, hold on, let me, is that in there? For real? So the Bible not only teaches that wives should submit themselves to their husbands, but husbands also should submit themselves to their wives. That doesn't negate the fact that God is calling the husbands to be leaders in their home, to be responsible for the home, but ultimately submission should be one to another. So I start thinking, because watch this, when, when, when something is applied to somebody else, it's easy to just assume what that role is. But when it's applied to you, now you want what, what, what exactly does it mean for real? So when I thought submission was just for my wife, I was like, well, yeah, yeah some girl, girl, get in there and cook me some. <laughs> so, so when I saw it was equal submission, she, she could tell me to go cook some too. <laughs> I wanted to know biblically, what does it mean? What is God asking for in submission 
for a husband to a wife and a wife to a husband. And Paul, he dialogues from verses 23 all the way to 33, and he gets to the good stuff at 33, and he tells us what submission looks like in a home. It looks like, watch this, however, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is what mutual submission looks like. It looks like me loving her and her honoring me. Now, how that plays out in the house differs from house to house. In one house, it looks like maybe a wife fixing her plate, fixing her husband's plate, and, and that's, that's a sign of her honoring him. But in my house, that ain't necessarily the case because sometimes I prefer to fix my own plate because my wife fixed the plate, and I'll be like, who is this for, Nate? <laughs> All I get is one piece of chicken. <laughs> that's it. I, I'm going to fix my own plate next time. You understand? It plays out differently depending upon the house, but the general rule is when you submit yourselves, brothers, to your wife, you demonstrate it by the love and care that you show her. And sisters, when you demonstrate yourself to your husband, you, you, you're honoring and you're showing respect to him as the man of God. Can I get a witness in this place? Now, I'm going to get to this in just a minute. I just want to throw it out there because the Bible says husbands love your wife, not love your good wife. Not love your nice wife. And it says, wives, respect your husband, not your honorable husband, but respect him. One of the things I love, and, and my military guys, I really love them the most because, and I can't say that. Did I just say that? <laughs> well, I'm, it's out there now. I love y'all more than everybody else. <laughs> it's out there now. One of the things that I admire about the guys that come here with the military background is they have an understanding that my respect is to you based on the position that you hold to my, in my life, not just based on whether I like your behavior or not. So it doesn't matter whether I like what you did or not. When you come by as my position, I salute you based on who you are in my life. Yeah. 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 It's too interesting, and I asked my son to pick, son, which story would you like for me to tell? Because he asked me, you know, we have a rule where I give my son like $5 every time I use him, and uh, so he sent me a um, uh, cash app request <laughs> for like $10, $15, $10, something like that, because I used him three, t three times. So instead of sending him $15, I sent him $30. And he was like, thanks, Dad. I was like, oh, no, this, this is for future. <laughs> for future. So I have this thing with my son. We're always telling him, man, stop arguing with the refs. And man, if the refs give you a call, just, just, go, just play ball. And so Friday night, he was, was it Friday night? He was playing. Y'all know how he doing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, was, it was two seconds on the clock before halftime. And, and Greg do this, he, he, when, he, when he get fouled, he think he want, you know, trying to draw a foul, he do this ugly little face. He was like, going up for a late, he said, ah! And the ref just sat there like this. He was like. <laughs> and the ref was like, it's halftime, I'm going to my, I'm going to get some Gatorade. The reason I challenge him with that is because the ref is an authority figure. And you honor him not based on his call. You honor him based on he, his position. Come on, somebody. And so when I love my wife, I love her not because she act the way I think she ought to act or don't. No, I love her because the Bible declares that this is my wife right here, and you love her because she's my daughter. Y'all ain't saying nothing in this place. Matter of fact, God spoke to me one time, and he says, your wife is my daughter. In, us, in essence, he was saying, get it correct. If you mistreat your gir my girl, watch this, your wife, you're mistreating my daughter. So keep this within the context of what we're dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. God requires mutual submission, and in mutual submission, it means that the husband, he shows unconditional love to his wife. The wife shows honor and respect to her husband. So let's deal with the text, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Uh, Paul writes, and he says, but there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. The head of Christ is God. In the Greek, the word woman is wife. Man in this particular text is husband. 
So what Paul is not saying is just because you a woman, come on somebody, that you're supposed to be submitted to some man. No, he's talking about within the context and confines of marriage. And what he's getting ready to say for the rest of the text has to deal directly with marriage, not just order of a wife, uh, excuse me, a man or a woman. No, it's, he's not talking about that at all. So he gives some instructions, laying the foundation that understand, yes, wife, your husband is the leader of the home, but Christ is his leader. And if you are to be following him, he ought to be following Jesus. So he's going to give some more instructions based on this order of leadership. He says, a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying, but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head, for this is the same as shaving her head. Before we deal with this head covering issue and shaving and all this other kind of stuff, let's just look at the meat of what's really in the text. Both men and women are praying and prophesying. Both men and women. That means praying. That means that speak. She and he are speaking to God for people prophesying. They're speaking to people on God's behalf. Watch this. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 17. And it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your who what? Your, your what? Your sons and what? And not just men, but sons and daughters shall what, y'all? They shall prophesy. In the book of Luke, chapter number 2, verses 36, the Bible declares, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Acer. She was of great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple but served God. Watch this. With fasting and praying, she was praying night and day. 38 declares, And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all them that looked for redemption. So not only did the woman pray, but she also prophesied. Prophesy means to tell, foretell events, speak under inspiration, exercise the prophetic or office, or to declare the word of God. So some of us have grown up in a society, church, traditional context, again, where there's been some, and I'm going to debunk that next week, where we've heard that women keep silent in the church. Yeah, man, you, you just, you, you keep silent in the church. And it's crazy because the same brothers that preach that, they want the sisters to sing and read announcements. <laughs> now, if she's going to be silent, just let her be silent. Now, don't be asking her to do that. As a matter of fact, that ain't, that, ain't, that ain't a bad deal. So I ain't got to do nothing up in her. <laughs> no, this misinterpretation of what the Apostle Paul is communicating in 1 Corinthians 14. Um... Because Paul says here that both the men and the women, they are prophesying. Just look at a sister and ask her, when you going to pray? And look at him and ask him, when you going to start prophesying? Because you ought to be talking to God on the behalf of people, and you should be talking to people on behalf of God. Prophesying in the Scripture, not only is it foretelling, but it's also preaching and declaring. And watch this. You won't find many, no, I, I want to say any, but I'm going to say many. You won't find many verb forms preaching in noun form. It's always in verb form. So preaching is not a title, it's actually a responsibility. And we should all be preachers of the gospel. So within context, watch this. Uh, th there, are, there are types of, two types of biblical commands that I want to highlight um, the first type is a cultural transferable command, and then the second one is a principle-driven command. Cultural transferable command. So that means that the Apostle Paul, he will teach something um, that transcends the, the, the culture of that particular time, and it applies to this particular day. So when he talks about fornication and adultery and all that kind of good stuff, um, he's not just saying, y'all just don't do that because, you know, that's a cultural thing, but it's, it's okay for this day. No. What, what was said for then is good for this particular day. But there are some principles, there are some commands that are given um, that are not about culture, but it's about the principle in the culture. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, Deke, if you could come here just for a second. This is my good deacon right here. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe the Word of God? Do you want to follow the Word of God? Absolutely. So this is what the Bible says. All the brethren greet you, greet ye one another with a holy kiss. 
<laughs> have a seat, sir. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat, D. Have a seat. <laughs> D. <laughs> now I'm pretty surprised because I remember D. Years ago, we was in. Uh, we were traveling somewhere. And I told Deke he was going to, you know, it was like four brothers and we were just going to share a bed. Deke said, I ain't sharing no, bread, no bed, Pastor. I ain't sharing no bed. I said, Deke, I mean, we just, we just all in the room. Together. No. As soon as we got in the room, he made a pallet on the floor. <laughs> For three nights, Deke slept on the floor. <laughs> now, now y'all hear him now, y'all hear him. So, so, so here, here, is the, here is the culture of this particular time. Brothers, when they greeted each other, they greeted each other like this. So is Paul teaching culture, or is it the principle that we actually should be list, looking for, that when you greet one another, you actually greet each other with love? Watch this. Give me some, Doc. Bam! Did y'all feel that? Did you feel that love? That was a lot of love right there. So the command is not about kissing. The, co man, the command is actually about demonstrating love one to another. Are y'all with me? So, so watch this in 1 Corinthians 11, 4. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying, but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. Let, let me deal first of all with what the ban issue is and what's going on in this particular society, in this particular culture. Um, Bruce, Bruce Winters, he helps us in the New Believers, excuse me, New Bibles commentary. He says, it was a, the pagan custom for the priests of a cult who were drawn from the elite of society to, to distinguish themselves from other worshipers by praying and sacrificing with their heads covered. Is it that there were some among the minority of Christians from the social elite who wish to draw attention to their status by praying or, and prophesying with their head covered. The dishonoring would be in drawing attention to his secular status when Christ is the one to whom attention should be directed when praying. So, so watch this. Um, um, just enter, hey, uh, Brother Eric, stand up just for a second. Yeah. Man, I am glad to have you, sir. I'm glad to have you. Where are, uh, where are, uh, Roger, where Roger at? Roger outside. Um, yeah, my, my, my brother, I don't know why you, you, you've been gone so long, your name don't slip me. Stand up, you know who you are. Brother Corey, yeah, stand up. Yeah, you know who you are, stand up. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. So Brother Corey is like a Sigma, y'all. Everybody say boo. You, you know. You know, any more sigmas in the house? Any, any sigma? Yeah. Any kappas in the house? Any kappas? Any kappas? You just stand up. You know, you know, you just, you can stand up. Come on. Stand up, man. Everybody say, boo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, not, not you, not you, because there's something special about you. I want you to know. So, I just found out that my boy is an alpha, y'all. Everybody say, hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> no, that sounds like a cue, right? <laughs> So, so, so watch this, uh, you know, when he, he was like, yeah, pastor, you know, I, you know, I bless Alpha, and you know, and I'm just sitting there like, for real, I ain't telling him, you know, to the end of the conversation, all that kind of stuff, and I'm, I'm really proud about that, but watch this, this is what I've never done, although I, I you know, I embrace my fraternity, I, I, I like my fraternity, all that kind of stuff, I've never stood up here and preached in the A5A paraphernalia, you know why, because preaching in that would draw attention to my letters and not to Christ. So as a preacher, teacher, my mentor, he trained me not to do extra stuff that brings attention to you, that draws attention away from Jesus Christ. So watch the stuff you wear. Watch the amount of jewelry that you wear. Watch the type of suits that you wear because your suit could be so shiny. Come on, somebody. That people are seeing you and they be like, oh, that show is a shiny suit. Are y'all with me in this place? So watch this. Just the other day, I was getting ready to pray, and um, I had a, a, a cap on, and um, before I prayed, I took the cap off. Because, thank, thank you, sir. I took the cap off, and then I prayed. 
And then when I really thought about it, I kind of laughed to myself because this has become a cultural expression from this particular text that when you pray or prophesy, you take your cap off. Well, what I did has nothing to do with the context of this particular text. The context is, brothers in this particular day, they wore a certain headdress based on their status in society. So when they stood before you, they were preaching in authority of their secular status, not the authority of Christ. So Paul says, take their hat off. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But when it comes to a woman, he says a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Now, it'll be a lot of sisters in, in, in trouble with this particular text in this culture here because believe is everywhere. <laughs> believe, believe, believe everywhere. <laughs> Stand up, sweetie. Slank it. Believe everywhere. <laughs> now, Watch this, IVP background commentary has this to say. It says, women's hair was a common objective, object of lust in antiquity, and in much of the Eastern Mediterranean, women were expected to cover their, their hair. To fail to cover their hair was thought to provoke male lust, as bathing suits is thought to provoke it in some cultures today. So, one of the ways to recognize someone if they were a prostitute or not it was the girl with the long hair that was uncovered because it was an object of lust in this particular culture so, so to, to, to proof text it um, you, you guys remember our dialogue in the song 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 of solomon a couple of months back and in chapter number four um they're in the bedroom chamber and she is enticing him in the bedroom chamber and he's literally describing her body from head to toe and he starts out in verse number one and he he says behold you are beautiful my love behold you are beautiful your eyes are doves behind your veil your hair is like a flock of goats goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead at that particular time he's describing of a, a scene of these black goats trampling down the mountain and what she's doing she has her hair tied in the bun and covered because she came from outside. That was the common expression of respect that I'm not the loose woman. Uh -huh. But when she gets in the bedroom chamber, not only does she uncover her hair, she lets it, come on, come on, baby, do that, do that. <laughs> she, she did. She, Numbers chapter number 5, verse number 13. Speak to the people of Israel. If any man wife goes astray and breaks faith with him, if a man lies with her sexually and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband and she is undetected though she has defiled herself and there is no witness against her since she has not taken, uh, not taken in the act. 14 says, if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife, who has defiled herself and is interesting. He doesn't know, but he's beginning to suspect something concerning his wife. There's a particular protocol that the priests, uh, that they would do in this particular day to, to render her innocent or guilty of actually committing adultery. And this is a part of the protocol. And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and unbind the hair of the woman's head. So they would literally cause her to drop her hair down because unveiled hair is a sign of whoredom or a prostitute and when Paul speaks against this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 the Romans if you were caught cheating on your wife excuse me if you as if a woman was caught cheating on her husband they would shave her head and so this is the real issue that's going on in the church and Paul has to fight this balance between grace and law constantly he fights against law so hard that he winds up leaving the people open to a liberty to feel as though that they can do everything 
that they want to do with no consequences. So you find him, especially in the book of Corinthians, having to self-correct some of his harsh teaching against the law. Because the women know and understand that whether I cover my hair or not has nothing to do with my salvation. My salvation is based on, based on faith in Christ. But Paul corrects this, and he's saying, no, it's not about your salvation, but there is something else in, at stake with you having uncovered hair because this is the sign of a prostitute. And But you say, but I ain't no prostitute, though. I know you're not saying you're not a prostitute, but the people that you preach to, when they look at you, they see a sign of a prostitute. Y'all ain't saying nothing in this place. So in all actuality, it's not about your liberty. It's about you ruining your own witness concerning the people that you're trying to reach. Reach. So sisters cover your head. That's what he says. And he's going to say later, not only that, but it dishonors your husband because you're walking around and people know you married. It's like my wife walking around with no wedding ring on. What in the world are you doing walking around with no wedding ring on? It dishonors me saying that you are available when you're supposed to be committed. So the symbol of hair covering in their day is the symbol of a wedding ring in our particular day. Here has been the issue with the church. We have not done proper hermeneutics on certain texts, and we wind up making a bunch of women walking around with dollies, come on somebody, on their head, looking, I ain't, ain't going to say that, just looking. With dollies on their head, and that's not even what the man of God is saying. It's all about you honoring your husband and demonstrating respect to the man you say you love. If a wife does not cover her head by implication, she is regarded as someone who refuses to recognize her relationship with her husband and her, her marital status. It's about, watch this, her, that woman not covering her head in that day is the same as my wife in this day refusing to wear her wedding ring because this is a sign that you're actually committed. In their day, this was the sign that you committed to a. Why y'all laughing? What? Is some lint left? So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be ministering from this subject, honoring him, loving her. Honoring him, loving her. Paul's command was about honoring your husband. Had very little to do with how you actually wore your, he your hair, but in not covering your hair, it's a symbol in that particular cultural society that you are uncommitted to your husband. And Ephesians teaches the husband and the wife to both have mutual submission, and the way you submit yourselves to her is by loving her the way she submits herself to you is by honoring you as her husband so I asked God I said God so how, how do I close this message out I'm, you know, I'm kind of stuck man how I close this message out and so God said just share your story share your story so, so here's my little story y'all um, I'll never forget um, of course my wife and I uh, a few weeks ago we celebrated 20 years of marriage so 21 years ago yeah 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 so 21 years ago, um, I'm sitting in front of our marriage counselor, Pastor Arthur Siggers. And we still go see him today. And it's not about whether we're having problems. I mean, you should, you, ladies, you should do an annual, right? Annual checkup. You, you should have like a tune-up on your car every so often, right? Well, you should do a marital tune-up whether you're having problems or not. So we go, with marital, go, go for marital tune-ups um, pretty much every year. But 21 years ago, I'm sitting in his office, and he, he, he got his head over his hand on his head like this. And he looked at me, he said, Greg, you got anger issues, don't you? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I was surprised that he noticed that because I did so well masking it. Because I was never the anger, you know, it's some kind of angry, you know, it's some type of angry people. They get mad. They, you know, flip over chairs and they, you know, knock stuff down. I was never that angry. I was the silent anger. I demonstrated the type of anger that when you make me mad, you so cut off <laughs> that you don't even know you cut off until you need something. 
<laughs> Y'all ain't said that. Just, just angry. Done with you. And so I thought that that was a better way of dealing with my anger as opposed to other guys I knew. They get mad. They flip over tables. They punch holes in walls. I ain't, I ain't doing none of that. But, but on the inside, I was holding some stuff. So I thought it was good until I got married. Because how you cut your wife off? You say you don't. Well, I, I, I was trying to. So this is what I did. She'll make me mad. She'll make me mad. I just go days without talking to her. And I would talk just enough so if she desi decided to call Pastor Siggers and say, my husband gave me the cold treatment, I can say she's lying because I, I say, well, good morning, Irene. <laughs> I'm going to get something for lunch. Would you like something? I mean, I was just enough, but brother man was cold. And it was not only messing up my marriage, it was eating me up on the inside, man. Because she was fine, y'all. And I was, I was, how can I make up just for a few moments and then going back to being cold? Come on, somebody. <laughs> just being real. So God started dealing with me out of the text, and, and this is some things that he has reiterated over the years for me to do towards my wife. Not to wait to love the future better version of her, but to love her now. Because some of you brothers in here, you'd have no problem at all loving your wife if she was perfect. But because they're not perfect, because they do make mistakes, and every mistake is not necessarily a moral mistake. Sometimes it's just a preference mistake. I, I give you another situation, just, just Friday night. Did you know I was upset with you? But I, I did it, though. I still showed love. Friday night, me and brother Monte in here? Good, I'm going to talk about it. Monte, we were lifting tables, getting things ready for the Super Bowl party. And Monte, he wasn't lifting nothing. I'm talking about I'm lifting. He just trying to drag. I said, man, we're lifting the table. He's still dragging the table. So we moved all the tables, set everything up, and my wife, it took us a good 45 minutes. Brother, tired, tired, tired. My wife come in after we done, like, why y'all move these tables like this? You need to put this back. I'm like, oh, Jesus. You're going to have to help your boy up in here. And then she's standing there with her arms for, if you're going to tell me what to do, at least get, let's get the company. Because I ain't got no help. Monty ain't picking up nothing. She's just standing there with her own phone, just, <laughs> you probably, bro, you probably did that on purpose, too. You, uh, you probably did. So I'm all upset. And watch this. Years ago, years ago, um, that little incident would have ruined the entire rest of the night. Rest of the night. I refused to let it get to me. I, I did. I did. And this is what God showed me years ago. And, and again, far from perfect, but this is what I strive to do. Because, man, how you love someone when they make you upset? How do you, because again, for the husbands, God doesn't say love your perfect wife, love your good wife. He doesn't even say, it would be great if he says, husbands, love thou nicest wives. He don't say that. He just say, husband, love your wife. But, Lord, she being mean. Love her. Love her. So, that's what God showed me years ago, and this is what I strive to practice. <laughs> See how this purse overflowing? <laughs> How many of y'all carry this in y'all purse? <laughs> Watch this. The flu, the devil is a lie. <laughs> oh no, what's Jesus? So watch this. Watch this. 
this purse is so packed that stuff that's in it can't help but to fall out of it. God told me that's how you love your wife. Watch, watch, watch this, watch this, watch. You should love her out of the ov overflow of your love for me. The problem with you loving your wife is you're trying to love her in your own strength. But if you would make the choice to fall so love and so in love with me that what we have spills over and it touches everybody around you. I did forget her bag. She ain't gonna take it back. It's been infected. <laughs> Go on and spray the bag and put it in your little purse. <laughs> I'm done, Chris. Somebody shout overflow. So sisters, how did this apply to you? Because I know I still get on your nerves. I know I do. I know I do. Yep. She was, she, was she was fussing the other day because I moved something and I didn't put it back. <laughs> but here's the deal um, for the ladies. As you cultivate honor and respect towards God as who he is in your life, what you have with God, it begins to overflow and spill onto every other relationship in your life. This is all I'm saying. Paul is challenging them to fix horizontal connections. But I'm telling you today, it's close to impossible to fix horizontal relationships if your vertical relationship is messed up. So, so I am a teacher and, and I, I, teach the, I teach principles of the word of God. But the principles that I teach you to help you with horizontal relationships are only as good as your vertical connection. So I'm into this message with this simple thought. Get back connected. Get back connected with God. Get back connected with God. Years ago, one of my mentors, he told me, I was, I was stressed out, I was losing it. Man, I was, I was angry, I was upset. I didn't know what was going on with me. And he looked at me, I ain't even talked to him a good 10 minutes, he just looked at me and he said, I know what your problem is. He said, you're not eating enough. I said, what you mean? He said, you're not eating enough. For as much word and wisdom that you're giving out to other people, you're not feeding yourself enough spiritually. It's like a mother, watch this. It's like a mother dying, giving nutrition to a baby. And she only feeds herself enough to feed the baby. So the baby is getting healthy and the baby is growing, but inside she's dying because she's not feeding herself enough. So I had to make the choice to fall in love with God all over again, get in the word of God, get on my face and begin to talk to God even the more. Avail myself for spiritual impartations. Even on the Sunday morning, what I'm pouring into you guys is only as good as what I've received from him. If I receive nothing, I have nothing to pour. But if I stay in his face and I get more and get more and get more and get more, every Sunday I got more to pour. Well, watch this. I need more of his anointing, not for y'all, but for my family, because I only see y'all once a week, maybe twice a week. But I see my babies every day. I see my wife every single day. And they're pulling on me. They're pulling on me. They're pulling on me. And it's okay. They're supposed to pull on you. You they mama. You they daddy. They're supposed to pull on you. Well, if they're going to pull on you like that, how about you stay in God's faith to continue to get a refill so the more they pull, the more you got to give. God says, wives, honor your husbands. He says, husbands, love your wives. But your love and your honor ain't going to be no good if our relationship ain't no good. So let's get back to the basics. If you want to make it right with her, you got to make it right with him. If you're going to make it right with your husband, you need to make it right with God the Father. Can somebody say amen to that? Come on to give God a hand clap of praise all over this building. I'm done. So this is what I want to do. I want to pray, man, real quickly. I want to pray. And I'm very, very grateful for my salvation and what God has done in my life. The Bible declares, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him 
don't have to perish, but you can have eternal life. Can somebody say amen to that? Romans teaches if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. But you know, that's not, it, it only takes that one time for salvation, but for sanctification, living it out, it's something that you do every day. So every day I confess him as Lord. Every day I yield myself and submit myself so that he can operate and move through me to touch and to minister to people that, that he loves. And so I want to give you an opportunity to do either one or two of those things. Maybe it's a first-time confession. And it's real easy. If the Spirit of God is pulling on your heart, he's talking to you right now. I wonder if he's talking to me. Is he pulling?